Presbyterian Church called a meeting to decide what to do about the squirrels. After much prayer and consideration, they determined that the squirrels were predestined to be there and they shouldn't interfere with God's divine will. At the Baptist church, the squirrels had taken an interest in the baptistry. The elders met and decided to put a water slide on the baptistry and let the squirrels drown themselves. The squirrels liked the slide, and unfortunately, they knew instinctively how to swim. And so twice as many squirrels showed up the next week. Squirrel problem was still there. The Episcopal Church decided that they were not in a position to harm any of God's creatures. So they humanely trapped their squirrels and set them free near the Baptist church. Two weeks later, the squirrels are back when the Baptist took down the water slide. The squirrel problem is still there. But the Catholic church came up with a very creative strategy. They baptized all the squirrels and consecrated them as members of the church. Now they only see them on Christmas and Easter. Not much was heard from the Jewish synagogue, but it's rumored that they took one squirrel and circumcised him, and they haven't seen a squirrel on the property since. And yes, the squirrels also heard that there were a lot of nuts at the Church of Christ, believing they were the only ones going to heaven. However, when they arrived, they found a cleanly swept parking lot in clean carpets, but no acorns. But they'll never be back because they learned that deacons set traps in their foyer. And they caught one of our nut seekers and the preacher put him out of his misery with one blow to the head. Squirrel problem is all over the Internet. And when I look at the different things said, the squirrels are a particular problem, but it's interesting to see how other stories put it. I use this one not to just have a second one. There's a point to it. But listen to it. Squirrels plagued every church in this little town. And every service and every church, squirrels ran the rafters, rolled nuts down the aisles, chattered during the sermon. All the preachers went crazy to get rid of the squirrels. The Roman Catholic priest tried exorcism. Still the squirrels overran every service, running the rafters, rolling nuts down the aisles, and chattering during the homily. That's the way the Catholics describe it. The Methodist minister instituted a health program to socialize the squirrels and incorporate them in the town's mainstream culture. Still every service in this church, squirrels ran the rafters, rolled the nuts, and chattered. The Baptist preacher tried immersing the squirrels, and who can blame him if he held them under a little longer than other baptismal candidates, but more squirrels ran his service, rolling nuts, etc. You get the picture. At the Interdenominational Ministerial Alliance, at their meeting, they were discussed the problem all the churches had in common with the unruly squirrels. They assembled the preachers, realized that no squirrels had shown up at the town's Episcopal church. Why not? The Episcopal rector explains, squirrels used to bother us too, but I baptized and confirmed them, making them full-fledged Episcopalians. Now they only come on Christmas and Easter. Why do I use this second one? Because this is what came to a mind of a man who has a wife with terminal cancer. And he tried to get her ready to come to Easter service at their church. And she just couldn't make it. And so they remembered this story together. What's interesting to me that you have the Episcopal rector and you have the Catholic church doing the same thing. Baptizing them, confirming them. And you get rid of the squirrel problem because they only come on Christmas and Easter. Well, that's the Church of England, Episcopal. They were opposed to the Catholic Church, but not when it comes to Easter and Christmas. And you begin to ask, why? 
Why Easter? Why, why that word? Why do we, the churches, celebrate in the religious world? Why, why do they do that? And they're doing that today. Remembering this day. And you might say, well, I know why. It's because that is commemorating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We celebrate the resurrection. And I say something that important that you might have terminal illness, but I will make it to that service if I can. Why would that be important? And why is it if it's so important? Why do we remember it just once a year in the religious world? On Easter. I think there'll be a number of reasons, but I, I want to clarify. So I'm not saying that nobody in these denominations only remember the resurrection on one day. That's wrong. They, do, they don't do that. But why do they celebrate it? Why do they set it apart that this is an important day? Even Good Friday is an important That's when Jesus died. And the parking lot, the Baptist church down the road, just packed full of people. Not, they're not going into the sanctuary. They're outside and they're playing games and they're Easter egg hunting and things connected with Easter. It's important. And I'm not saying they don't remember the resurrection, but why do they have that every year? It's because of their calendar. If I were practicing Easter as a religious holiday, it's because that's a religious calendar. Don't you have one? And we'll look at the religious calendar from the standpoint of the moon or the sun. And it's, well, it's because of that calendar. What is that Christian calendar? Where's the, there's the Christian annual festivals, don't you know that? There's the Annunciation. Annunciation? That's when the angel told Mary she's going to have a child. Not born a man. In the sense of born of a, of a male. Relationship with a female. It was the virgin Mary. And we'll have that on March the 25th because that's nine months before December 25th. And you know what happens on December 25th. That's when this baby's born. And we got another celebration for that one. So why does the Annunciation start? Because that's when he's going to be born. Lent, 40 days of Lent is when you give up something special to you as it marches toward Easter. And then you have that holy week in which things happen. Palm Sunday came a week before. We've got to celebrate that one. That's when he came into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey with all the branches. And we'll have a song for that. But this holy week as he's there, we'll, we'll be celebrating that. And then the Easter, we're going to celebrate that. Because Jesus rose, there'll be an ascension day 40 days after Easter. And then there'll be Pentecost. Seven Sunday after Easter. It's on your calendar. We're going to do it because not that the resurrection is not thought about all the time. It represents the resurrection of Christ, but it's on our calendar. That's what we do when we're in these various denominations. Then you get Christmas Day in December the 25th. You got an epiphany, a whole, that's had a lot of history in the religious world. Used to be his baptism and his birth was at the same time celebrated. But his baptism is separated. Because see, that's when he was made known in his ministry. It's his baptism. We'll celebrate Jesus' baptism. And then some, not all, some have All Saints Day where we think about going to heaven and what will happen to us. And so these are important events. Are they based on the Bible? Yes, they are. <laughs> But we don't see them in first century Christianity when the apostles walked the earth. And shortly after, when the effects of their teaching and now all was left was now the word of God. And we can move all sorts of ways in the word of God and get what we want. But you're connecting Bible 
with these festivals, and they've got a calendar, and we remember them. That's why we remember Easter. That's why we have Easter. Don't the Jews, didn't the Jews in God's day have a religious calendar? Oh, yes, they did. Now, it may not have been written down like this, but this is true. Yet all sorts of things, even up to the time of the dedication of the temple, Hanukkah, at the end of December. Jesus is in Jerusalem at that particular time. And that's not even found in the Bible. That's an intertestamental period. But it's on the calendar. They remember it. Hanukkah. And it just happens to kind of be at the same time when people are celebrating Christmas. But the Jews had a calendar. You'll notice in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, verses 4 through 8, we find that there were three feasts that they were to remember. And one of them would be the Passover. Notice on the calendar, it is the first month. It is the beginning of their time as the Jews. On that 14th day, they were to slay that sacrificial lamb. 15th day would be the Passover. They're going to be exiting out of Egypt. And the angel would pass over, pass over the houses that had the blood on it. God would save them. Even God's people, if they didn't do that, were going to lose their firstborn. Firstborn of the animals. Pharaoh said, let them go now. Let them go. But that was to remem be remembered on that particular day every year. Once a year it was remembered. So don't sit there and get high and mighty with me because we have it once a year. I'm not. I'm trying to understand it. And not only that, after that Passover, we find in verse 16, that will be the 50 days, Leviticus 23, 16, and you'll see on the deal of Pentecost. 50 days after the Passover, that count, 50 days, Pentecost. We know Acts 2, that's when the church was established. But on the Jews, the Jews, that would be the day that would honor that. It was kind of at the time of the wheat harvest as well. In Leviticus 23, 33 through 34, we've got the booths that we see here. Fruit harvest, shelters. There's your Feast of Tabernacles. I got Bible for that. You do too. And it was part of God's law. God said that's when you're going to remember that. And by the way, in Exodus, the 23rd chapter, verses 14 through 17, that's when, verse 17, all the males were to go to Jerusalem for that feast. They were to travel. And you get mad at people going to Bethlehem to remember the birth of Jesus? No, I understand it. Jews did it. And so Christianity, after the apostles leave this earth, and after they're no longer there to talk what you bite in, we find apostasy taking place. We only have the word of God left. And hopefully you've got people that will honor his word. Don't add to it, don't take away but we got all these feasts that New Testament Christianity didn't have. But I understand it. If I were raised in these groups, I would understand this is on our calendar. This is what we do at this time of year. And I got some Bible for this one. Secondly, <coughs> I got in the King James translation too. The Bible does talk about Easter in the King James translation. And what has happened is that it becomes the Christian Passover. Oh, I got Pas Pascha is the Greek term here, the Aramaic term connected with that, in the sense that it, is, it means the Passover. But if you look at the King James translation in Acts, the 12th chapter, you'll find in the King James translation, Easter is in your Bible. It was a time when Herod is persecuting the apostles. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, as he killed one of the apostles, he pre proceeded to seize Peter also. And these were the days of unleavened bread. Mark that. Get that in your mind for context. And when he had taken him, he put him in prison and delivered him to the four Quaternions of soldiers to guard him, tending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. What the King James translation says. 
But 28 times, every time else, every time you see that particular Greek word in the King James translation, it will be Passover. Now, how would you know it's Passover and not Christian Easter at this time? It's because it was the unleavened bread. That's what you had with the Passover. You had the unleavened bread that was not to be part of their house. It was on that, that night in which they were escaping. They didn't have time for the bread to leaven. It was quick. You get out. You get out of Egypt. And that was remembered in the Passover feast. And so what happens is that, well, Pascha, we know it's Passover, but it's very quickly. Let's just change that and we'll make the Christian Passover. And we'll still call it Pascha. Well, that's a Jewish Passover. No, it's Christian. It's, we're Christianizing it. You Christianize squirrels? We can Christianize Pascha. And here is that change that takes place. And so what else do we see? Why would, why would the King James translators do that? Because by the time of 1600, that was Easter to the minds of the English-speaking world. And the apostasy began in the second century. You have the seventh and eighth century where you have record where people were distinguishing the baptism of Jesus from his birth. It's talking about the, about the Easter and all those things, all those festivals. They said, you know what? If we, we, we just make, make that, we'll Christianize those things. And it will have a better inroad, Gregory the Pope, Gregory Pope first, Gregory the first, the Pope, in head time. We'll have a better inroad with these people in pagan idolatry if we do things like that. But you want to find the authority for New Testament Christians to remember this day? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, and I'll give it to you. This is the authority that those who search for authority, they, it's not just on my calendar. But we'll find in Acts, the 12th chapter, when translators translated that way, but it still is Passover, just like it is everywhere else where they translate it. It's not speaking about Easter. But in verses 5 through 8, you know the context is dealing with withdrawing fellowship, meaning fellowship, they'd already broken fellowship with God, this man did, have his father's wife, adultery. And they were to recognize that by turning him over to the devil, so dissociating from him, you're, you're part in the camp of the devil, we can't have any fellowship with you. It was recognizing fellowship has been broken. Not that I'm disfellowshipping you. It's been broken, we're just recognizing it. We're not going to eat with you. And so he says, to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. We're not killing him. We're disassociating from him. So he'll wake up to his situation before God and save his spirit before the Lord comes back again, especially in the day of the Lord. Your glory is not good because they were slow to do this. <clears throat> Paul says this, Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out the old leaven that ye may be a new lump, such as, as they are the unleavened. For our Passover, Pascha, for our Passover also hath been sacrificed, even Christ. Wherefore, let us keep the feast. Did you get that, Christian? Keep the feast. Our Passover lamb is Jesus. Keep the feast. That's what we're doing. We're keeping the feast. Easter. Because it's a Christian Passover. I tell you, that's an easy, that's an easy step to take when you don't understand context. It's an easy step to take when we're honoring Christ. He's the Passover lamb, isn't he? Yeah. The context is limiting how we apply that because he's dealing with get the leaven out of your camp. Get the sinning man out of your camp. 
Don't you realize Jesus has been sacrificed? Keep the feast like they did. Not that you keep the Passover feast. Not that you make it Easter. Keep it by getting rid in your camp the leaven. That's the context. And you don't understand that. And you don't understand what Paul's saying. There's not five different ideas about it that fits what he's trying to set forth. That's what counts. What he had in his mind. And that's why we study. That's why we work hard on the text. Because false doctrine comes in and says, keep the feast. Keep Easter. It's on our calendar. It's the Christian Passover. Jesus is the Passover lamb. Come on and join us. The people, it's not the first time the Bible's been perverted in order to do what we want to do. Why Easter? Because that's just the festivities. And here we go back to 386 A.D. John Christendom was the archbishop in Constantinople. Remember, Christianity quit being persecuted and Constantine became a so-called Christian. And there on the southwest portion of the Black Sea, north of Turkey, on the coastline there was, was the capital of the Byzantine Empire, Constantinople. And he is preaching a sermon. From this feast, this 386 A.D., from this feast, that is the nativity, there's your Christmas feast, Christmas, the theophany and the holy Pascha and the ascension, and the Pentecost take their origin and foundation. Where do you get those words out of the Bible? <clears throat> so Pascha is the Greek the theophany, the appearance of God. You get the concepts, but say they already had it down. These were their particular feasts. And here's his point. <clears throat> if Christ hath not been born according to the flesh, he could not have been baptized. What's that? That is the theophany in our religious calendar world. He could not have been crucified, which is the Pascha. His crucifixion is being remembered that his passion, not only dying, but we, we moved that to Easter, haven't we? His resurrection. He could not have been crucified, which is the Pascha. 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 He could not have sent his spirit. That's Pentecost. Events in the Bible, yes. Yeah, Pentecost. We've seen that in the Jewish world and New Testament. But they have made them festivals and they had their basis upon Christmas, the nativity. Because if he's not born, all these other things don't occur. He said, that is something that becomes important. So you got religious history, even back to 386, but notice it's 386 and not 86 AD. It's 386, not AD 33. The apostles are no longer living. They left behind the Word of God, and people don't care too much about the Word of God, just so they find what they want to find. And so it allowed apostasy to have it. Paul warned about that in 2 Thessalonians 1. There is that which restrains, but when the restraint is done, the man of sin will be revealed. When you had Apostle Paul living, he came to Corinth with a rod. He was living, and you can try to kill him, but he was living, and he stopped apostasy. Apostles could do that. Here's what you have. Now, there may be division. That's just because you're going to find people that want the light. Paul argued that in the Lord's Supper. But when they're gone, all you've got, reveal word. And that's why to have a holy respect of what we do with that word is essential. Because that's why we have religious division. It's not this. It's our calendar. It's translators who, on one occasion, they made it Easter. But that was 1600. This already started back here. 
It's already in place in the English-speaking world. Why not put Easter in there? And why do they not do it everywhere else? Because they knew the context is there, but you've got the context of unleavened bread too. And keeping the feast and unleavened bread in 1 Corinthians 5 is not literal bread. It's getting rid of that sinning brother who won't repent. And praise God, he repented in the second epistle to Corinthians. And we're to forgive him. Doing what God said do, how he wants it done. That's what happens. And John Christendom brought that. Thirdly, why Easter? Because it's a new beginning. It's a new beginning. It's like spring. Aren't we ready for spring? Thank you. I've got old limbs still out in the, in the yard. I don't think we're on the high list of picking up trash. We got it out there and everybody else does too. I'm sick and tired of brown, aren't you? And to see some greenery, it's like spring. It's, we call it Easter. It's a new beginning. So is, that why, is that why you call it Easter? Yeah. You know why? Because that's a pagan goddess. Usta or Istra. She was recognized in the English speaking world as a goddess of dawn, the pagan world. Earliest remark is that's, that's, that's where the name came from. It identified a goddess of dawn, new beginnings. Don't you like the sunrise? Sometimes I like it better than the sunset. It's a new beginning. It's a new day. I'm going to beat the sun up. I'm going to do three or four things before the sun comes up. Here the sun comes up and says, you've accomplished a lot of things, man. Wonderful day. I like the sunrise. Oh, and Easter, you can have sunrise services. It's a new beginning. And you know why we call it Easter? Because that was a pagan goddess. Now, you don't want to talk about that in worship services. But it's a pagan goddess. And you know why we have it then? It's because the spring equinox, new beginnings. The sun is crossing the equator, coming from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere. And the moment it does, you start looking for that full moon. Because the first full moon after the spring equinox, you look then for the Sunday right after that. And that will be Easter. It's always changing, isn't it? Kind of early this year. Because this year, equinox won't, didn't, won't happen until Sunday, March the 28th. <clears throat> Which means Easter follows on the following Sunday. Bingo, today, April the 4th. That's why Easter changes all the time. And you've got to get a calendar and say, hey, am I going to be in town or not? Am I going to be visiting you there or not? You've got to have, what, what year are you going to talk about? Now, every 200 years, the Jewish Passover changed because of lunar things connected with the, with the moon. So we're not saying things don't change, but this changes all the time. When is Easter this year? It was that equinox. And so what happens, we're going to synchronize pagan festivals with a goddess and it will take that to be the sun springtime it's dawning of a new beginning called spring and the goddess of dawn goddess of spring is here and you know what that is a fitting thing for jesus's resurrection and there'll be people that celebrate easter that don't believe in the bodily resurrection of jesus christ it's just a new beginning and we know that Jesus was raised bodily. But forget about that. We, because all we have is the Word. I think Paul would be preaching on that. In fact, the Gospels and Paul, they nailed down for us about the resurrection. It wasn't just, oh, a new beginning. It was a spirit renewed, not the body from the tomb. But what happened is that we need to start putting those pagan festivals and we must put Christianity, must have one to, to identify with that so we can evangelize the world. That's what happened. 
Why Christmas, December the 25th? Some thought it was in the springtime at one time. Why put it there? Because pagan practices. We know Easter pagan practices. Christmas and Easter. We've got to have something to Christianize those. And we will make Christmas the birth of Jesus. And we'll make Easter the resurrection of Jesus. But they have a foundation in pagan idolatry. And New Testament Christians weren't practicing those things. They're not in the New Testament as they practice those things. So, my question is why the resurrection of Jesus Christ? That's the question. Notice I didn't say Easter. If you mean Easter is commemorating the resurrection of Christ, why don't we call it resurrection of Jesus Christ Day? Maybe it's too long. That's what we mean, Easter. Well, we bring pagan into Christianity because Christianity brought pagan into Christianity in order to identify with the world. Why don't we identify with the world by asking the question, why the resurrection of Jesus Christ? I'll tell you, number one, Christianity is a false religion not worth your time without this fact of his resurrection. We can close our doors, and I'm walking out of here. It's not based upon a feeling. <clears throat> it's not based upon anything like that. It's based upon a fact. Either he was raised from the dead, or he wasn't. Jesus says, our founder, Jesus Christ, said in John the second chapter, 19 through 22, you destroy this temple, I'll raise it in three days. He said, 46 years was this temple of Herod being built. You're going to raise it three days? After he was raised from the dead. They remembered that passage, zeal has eaten me up. But he was raised from the dead. What did Jesus mean when he said temple? Read your Bible. He meant the temple of his spirit. No. He meant the temple of his body. I will raise up what? A body. A bodily resurrection. It's not a new spirit, a feeling. It's a bodily resurrection. And Paul argues for our bodily resurrection based upon Jesus' bodily resurrection. <laughs> In verse 14, he says, And if Christ hath not been raised, this is why I said it's immaterial, our preaching is vain. Really? We're all of our preaching. What are you going to preach on today? I don't care what it is. It's founda foundation is, if, if Christ has not been raised, all of our preaching is vain. And let me tell you something else, he says, as he pen continues. And also, your faith also is vain. My faith? I'm celebrating Easter, man. My faith? Yeah, that's why... I, if this fact is false, then Christianity is a false religion. I don't care how new you feel today, because it's springtime. It's just false. Do you know how, to, how definitive that is and how distinct that is? We could have a religion. You know, a lot of good things Jesus said as a rabbi. We could continue on. We don't have to believe in the miracles. This is a miracle. Paul says, it's vain. My preaching and the hearer's faith is vain, empty, no substance. Let's go do something else. Nature belongs to all of us. Nobody has a corner on nature. I can enjoy it, you can enjoy it, we all can enjoy it. Let's go to the park and enjoy it. Because Christianity is false. If Jesus was not bodily raised from the dead. Secondly, you're still in your sins. Don't go from 1 Corinthians 15 yet. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is vain. I know that. You just said that in verse 14. And ye are yet in your sins. Now that's new. I can have a lifestyle and we'll call it Christianity. 
But here you're talking about my relationship with God. And what divides me from God is my sins. And I'm still in my sins. Yeah. If Jesus is not raised, that will be the case. And so, well, what does that say about my baptism? I was baptized unto the remission of my sins. Colossians 2, verse 11 through 13. He describes putting off the old man, or death, with a circumcision of Christ. Christ takes away something because he forgives us of our sins. And he calls it circumcision without hands, and Jesus does that. In whom you were also circumcised with a circumcision not made with hands, and the putting off of the body of the flesh. We do that, but he did that. We do that while we're determined to live a holy life, but he did that by forgiveness of our sins. See if he doesn't say that. Putting off the body of the flesh and the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him and raised with him through baptism, through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead, and you being dead through your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, you, I said, did he make alive together with him, having forgiven us our trespasses. When were we made alive together with Christ? When we're raised in baptism. He forgave us of our sins. That was the circumcision of Christ. He shed his blood to take that away. And now we're supposed to be determined to put on that new man, as Paul said in Colossians. In other places. What happened at baptism? And 1 Peter 3, 21, baptism is not the washing away of the filth of the flesh, but it's an answer of God to a good conscience, but it's water. As the sinful world was divided from the righteous, eight souls were saved through water, the medium of water, flood, water. Even so does baptism now save you. We're saved from a world of sin through baptism. All that's vain. Don't get worried about being baptized again. It's all vain. If Jesus has not been raised from the dead bodily. He lied or he's crazy. Because he said, talk about the body, the temple of my body. And either one of them, he's not worthy to serve. We could remember him as a rabbi like everybody else. But to put him on the planet of making the confession, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Good confession, let's go back here and baptize you. All oh, that's. If Jesus is not raised. Back to 1 Corinthians 15. He's not through yet. This bodily resurrection apparently is really important, but I don't read a thing about Easter. I read about the resurrection of Christ. <clears throat> and what he says in verses 18 and 19, that also they that have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. They perished. Well, they died. They fall asleep. They perish. They perish from this world of activity, and that's why we mourn them. We bury them. We put them out of our sight. Miss them. But you know what? After you're dead, if it's a lie, you will never know it. Some argue that is apologetics no reason why you ought to be a Christian? Because if we got it wrong, we'll never know it. But I tell you, if we got it right, you're going to know it. So therefore, Christianity is good? I know if I die, I perish if Christ has not been raised. But I'll never know it. And we think that's a good argument for Christianity. If you're going to bet on your life, bet on your soul, you better bet Christianity. Because we're covering all bases. Paul doesn't. Because he's got the next verse. If we have only hoped in Christ in this life, we are men most pitiable. Didn't say we're full of pity. We're objects of pity. I pity you. Because all you do is hope in this life for Christ. What Paul is saying, it's a sham. If Christ is not raised. And if we have put our hope in a Christ like that, don't just call me nuts. 
pity me. Because I only hoped in Christ in this life. Our hope goes right into eternity. It is an anchor for our soul. And what Peter says, that what did Christ do in his resurrection? He beget us unto a lively, lively hope. Through what? His resurrection. We have an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled. Face not away. Where is it reserved? It's reserved. Surety. It's reserved in heaven. For me? Yeah. For you? Yes. And what hope does, it puts our hope on the promises of God who cannot lie. And he promised it. It's sure, but it's based upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Bodily resurrection. I tell you, that's a lot more serious than just saying, let's celebrate Easter. We perish with no hope. We're still in our sins. Our faith is vain. That's why we have the resurrection of Christ in our Bible. And we think on it not just one time a year. We think upon it all the time. Appreciate Wayne as he gave thanks for the cup. His last phrase is that till he comes. We'll keep taking the Lord's Supper, which commemorates his death. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. We're not proclaiming his resurrection. Wayne's, Wayne distinguished that. But we proclaim his death till he, New King James, comes. America stand till he comes. But till he comes. Why is that? Because he was raised from the dead. He's ascended upon high. And we're proclaiming his death. That is the only memorial, memorial, remembrance, feast, well, feast, but the Lord's Supper that God commands us to take, to partake of. It's not Advent, Annunciation, Theophany. And we do that every week, not just one week a year. On the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached. Acts 20 and verse 7. And so we realized that we had come together to partake of the Lord's Supper as the church met on that first day of the week. And every week, we realized Jesus died for my sins. And we think about that. But if Jesus was not raised, you're still in your sins. Your faith is vain. All of this worship service stuff is really to no avail. Because it doesn't unite us back with God, as Dan said in his prayer. We come back to God. That's what Jesus delivered us to bring us to God. Not only in this life, to his word and salvation, but the ultimate place in heaven. And we remember that every first day of the week. I close the lesson by wanting you to think about what we began our worship service this morning with the reading of Hebrews, the seventh chapter, <coughs> to encourage those of you who are not members of the Lord's church, you may be here for the reason that, well, it's Easter. And no one's condemning you for having the desire to remember your Lord. Even from the standpoint of what people have done in history that may be unauthorized in God's word. But I tell you what is important. That we don't remember this just once a year, his resurrection. But it's the foundational thing of our faith that we live every day. And the Hebrew writer, again, put it this way. When we read in verse 21 of Hebrews 7, all the other priests, they were made priests without an oath. But God 
made Jesus a high priest, not only fulfilling Psalm 110 and verse 4, but with an oath. He's a priest forever. Well, that's our Melchizedek, but it's forever. There was no ending in death. There was a resurrection. By so much also Jesus had become the surety, the surety of a better covenant. We get a better covenant that can take away our sins. That's what Christ is offering you based upon the fact that of his resurrection, death and resurrection. They have indeed been made priests many in number because that by death they were hindered from their continuing. But not so with Jesus, but because he abideth forever. His priesthood is unchangeable. You don't have to ask for, who's the priest now? He will always be high priest. And the final thing, what a blessing. What a blessing. He's able to save to the uttermost them that draw near unto God through him. He ever liveth to make intercession for those people that want to come to God. If Jesus wasn't raised, I couldn't offer you the high priesthood of Jesus. He paved the way through his blood and his flesh to open the way up unto God. Just like the curtain was keeping the separation of the holy and the most holy, Jesus took, that's why the curtain was ripped from top to bottom when Jesus died. And through his blood, he opens that way, purifies us. And what he does, dear Christian, when you become a Christian, you don't have to ask for an appointment or wear a mask, or throw a card, present a card. You just got to come to him in prayer as a Christian. He ever liveth to make intercession. He ever liveth to make intercession. He ever lives to make intercession for you at that moment. That's not once a year stuff. If you're like me, it's everyday stuff. And a Christian has hope, not just in this life, but his hope is in heaven because of Jesus' resurrection. We don't celebrate Easter, but we sure do celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And we offer the invitation for you to do exactly what they did in the first century when they realized, I'm in my sins. We just read, Christ would like to do some circumcision on you. Oh, you won't hurt You'll be rejoicing because he forgives you of your sins. When you're baptized into his death where he shed his blood. And we're here to assist you to do that. We can raise you walk. New life because your faith is in God who raised him from the dead. And that is a fact. And so you have a surety of a new covenant. And you have the surety of heaven. Why not start that life of surety? We encourage you, invite you. Come forward. Make confession that I believe Jesus is the Son of God. And because you believe that He's died and rose again, we can baptize you, raise you to walk a newness of life for Jesus to ever, forever be your high priest. And He'll save you to the uttermost, even to heaven. Why not start that life as we stand and as we sing?